Hello, I'm Peregrine O'Gormley. I've been an artist all of my life. I grew up in the mountains, the Rocky Mountains of New Mexico, and there grew up in an outside environment continuously. Uh, my father built our house out of stone. Being in that environment really shaped me as a human being and, and certainly as an artist. Through early travel in my youth to the Northwest region, I, I really fell in love with it. My wife and I and, and our three children live in LaConnor, Washington, where my studio is. I began working, I would say, from really, really young. My, my grandfather was a sculptor. Um, my father was a sculptor. When I was four, I wound up doing some pieces at my grandparents' place. My grandfather gave me some pinch wax, some red pinch wax, after we had gone to the zoo that day. And I sat down making a number of animals, a wolf and a caribou and a series of ducks and eagle. And it was just, you know, playing. That following Christmas, my grandfather sent me a series of bronzes of each of those pieces. He took each of those waxes and uh, poured them in bronze and gave them each their own base. Uh, and for me, that was a pivotal moment in having someone else appreciate something that I was making. And really from that point on, I was, I was uh, creating things continuously. This is a piece that I did when I was about 18 or 19 years old. My sentiment of what was happening in the world and, and how it was being impacted by, by human influence was there from very early on. From the very get-go of, of me working with materials, it's, it's always been about the natural world. However, early on it was, it was largely figurative work, human figures that were the basis of my work, and then later on that transitioned more into animal forms. I have a degree in biology from Colorado College, and from college to 2008, I worked in a variety of, of fields um, making a living. I decided that if I didn't take the time to actually be carving full-time and devoting uh, my entire career to that, that I wasn't ever going to be able to take it where I wanted it to go. And so I made a decision in 2008 to completely transition to sculpting full-time. Uh, this is a piece that I did at the early stages of that. So I made that transition in 2008, and then this piece was created in 2009, and it's, it's titled Point Begets Line. It's a heron hunting a, a small fish. If you, if you look at the piece from the back, you'll see a, a very straight uh, line right down the spine of the bird, its head and neck aligned with its bill for the center of this fish. In the, in the heron, there's a, a pattern of the fish and fish's tail um, with a, a circle in the center, which emulates the circle in the center of the fish. And it talks about the point being the fish begetting this line, this trajectory of the, the heron and all of the heron's focus and its entire effort being aligned for that single focus. And then the two images emulating each other, referencing each other, to me is a discussion of the shared biology and the shared cycle that both the fish and the heron are involved in. This piece is titled Minus 25%, and it was inspired by an article I read in 2008 from the BBC which stated that scientists at that point believed that we had lost 25% of the wildlife on the earth in the preceding 40 years. I wanted to portray that story visually, so a lot of my work has, has gone in the direction of telling a story or, or a narrative. I've taken a, the imagery of a, of a falcon that's in a mantling pose, which is a protective pose uh, often used for 
protecting them when they're on the ground with prey and shielding it from other birds of prey that would, would steal their captured prey. But in this case, the, the falcon is mantling itself. It's, it's protecting itself. However, an entire quarter of itself has been removed. So this wing has been completely removed and the, the scapula and the clavicle are where that joint comes up to hold the shoulder joint is, is exposed. And it really talks about how is it possible for a system to, to protect itself, to perpetuate itself, to be able to thrive uh, when a quarter of itself is missing. And then the stylistic choices, I think we're talking about at this phase of my career, this was also in 2009, some people call it cubism, but it's the basically using very, very linear, very straight forms, very blocky forms to depict portions of the bird and then coming into a more, it's still, it's still stylized, but more realistic interpretation of, of the facial structure and the eyes and, and also the bones that are coming out. This is a piece called Flight After Mui Bridge. Mui Bridge was a photographer right at the cusp of cinematography. He was taking a series of still shots in rapid succession to capture the motion of animals and, and people. Um, one of those series was of an eagle taking flight in the studio. Just a compelling series and I referenced that imagery in this piece. Uh, the burning is both a communication about scorched earth um, but also as a manner to bring in the contrast between the varying colors. And uh, I use a lot of burning in my work and usually it's a reference to that scorched earth uh, concept and or the end of life or the human impact on our, on our planet. Often what's seen here is a, is a series of continents. So this is a piece called Old Tree and it's the title of this show at BIMA. The title itself is calling on the viewer to go beyond your initial take on the on the visual of an owl in the tree and actually focus your attention on the tree itself. The base is uh, created with a piece of Alaskan yellow cedar that's extremely old. It's 150, 200 years of growth represented in, in the inch and a half of depth of just this section of the tree. The Sawa owl doesn't hang out in the parking lot trees that we have on the street. They require a a forest and a forest system and an ecosystem that is is developed and that's mature. This is the bronze edition of Old Tree. From early on in my career, I started incorporating bronze into the mix. So working with wood primarily as the, the original sculpting medium and then uh, taking molds of those originals and creating bronze additions. It allows me to have not only an addition of the bronze, but also allows me to work with different color combinations with the patina and allows an element of, of permanence. The, the wood originals are, are quite delicate. You know, bronze is forever. That aspect is, is valuable. So this piece is titled Scythe. The intent here is to invoke that moment of death but not in a necessarily scary or dangerous way, but in a way that invites the viewer to think about what that moment will look like and about how they want to be living their daily lives with the knowledge that this day will come for each of us and that that concept of, of having death close at hand and, and essentially as an ally on your, on your shoulder is the intent of this piece. It's saying we have a limited time here and what do we want to bring to the table? How do we utilize this knowledge to, to make our lives and every moment be what we want it to be? This is a crack in everything and it's a reference to a Leonard Cohen poem, There is a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. And it's speaking about the fact that things go wrong, things change, things evolve, things get broken and out of that comes new growth, out of that comes new life. This particular one is, you know, a, essentially a tree growing out of that, that crack. When we talk about species extinction, you know, we all recognize uh, how this has come to pass, but when we start to talk about it with our kids and about the fact that, that we as collectively as a society have made decisions 
that have led to these extinctions, you start to have, have a, a more visceral feeling. My intent here is uh, I want to have the viewer feel that sense of the only thing that we have access to at this point of this species are the museum specimens. Some of the other pieces in this room are, they're in a, a moment of life. They're, they're in motion, they're, they're breathing, they're, they're actively living. Whereas this piece is not at all that. What we have left are, are just the remnants. And I want to create a feeling of that sense you have in your gut when you've missed the boat. This is a piece that's referencing our desire to catch our loved ones as they fall. And the peregrine is brought in as a shepherd matter because of their ability to stoop at speeds of up to 242 miles per hour, uh, the fastest living uh, being on earth. And I, I hesitate to use the, the term angel's flight because I don't subscribe to any particular doctrine but the, the spirituality surrounding death has, has become really visceral for me in the wake of my own father's passing. His death has, has really brought into my own life a, a very impactful sentiment towards death and, and the understanding of, of it and, and feeling surrounding it. One of the things that you've been seeing is that I've brought a number of my pieces onto the wall and I feel like one of the things that's, that's possible with that is that it helps convey motion, it can, helps convey the sense of uh, living being. This is Look Ma No Trees, and on the outside it's a, a very playful piece. Uh, it's a, modeling a Douglas squirrel, and if you have been you know, watch in the woods here, you often see them playing and chasing each other and, and having a grand time. Uh, in a certain sense, uh, look ma no trees is, you know, emulating what our children do when they're, they're trying out something new, they're, they're pushing the boundary and, you know, riding a bike with no hands, for instance. But uh, when you're looking at this title from a parental perspective or a stewardship perspective, we're looking at what does it mean to have no trees? What is it? What is? It, what dangers does that invoke? So this is Blood Hungry and the Very Small Voice. It's a piece that I conceived of in 2015 when I was approached to receive a log that a family had, was taking out of their yard due to it, the damage its roots were causing. And in the process of lifting that log, the vision of what I wanted to do with the piece was, was really clear. Then in the intervening five years, I've been collecting the, the pieces and the components necessary to actually achieve that vision acquiring the marble, which was from the Tolkien Quarry in Alaska originally, but was in, in Bellingham for close to 50 years. The stone was probably quarried 100 years ago. And then finding a, a log that was of enough girth. This was a redwood tree that came down in, a, in someone's backyard after a, an intense windstorm. Finding a single log that would accommodate this, this entire base at the girth that was required was unusual. In each of the components of this piece, I've been working with a number of additional challenges just due to the scale of the piece. This is Red Elm, and it was really wonderful to work with. I had, hadn't worked with it before. Normally I'm working with aromatic woods, um, cedar, red cedar, and Alaskan yellow cedar, always harvested from a sustainable source, more often than not dead down material or salvaged material. This hardwood had a number of different properties that I, I wasn't familiar with, but really enjoyed. I utilize burning a lot in my work, and I find that it adds a completely different element. But one of the things I really enjoy about it is the difference in texture that you get between the winter growth and the summer growth, so the softer material that's between the growth rings and versus the, the harder material. It really reveals that the grain of the wood in a, in a very special way. The intent with this one is to describe those multiple voices that we have in our head when we are reacting to a challenging situation. You have that kind of initial, often heated response to, to something, 
and the like intensity and upset that can be in, embodied in that. And then there's the another voice that's that's usually more subtle and usually a smaller voice that if you choose to go with that smaller voice and, and act upon it, often we are happier with the long-term results of that.